Thank you, Nathan. Good morning, church. It's nice to be with you this morning. Um, I really felt God's presence then, um, and like Nathan's been praying, I pray that he would continue to presence himself as we hear from him in his word this morning. If you were to ask David, King David, what advice would you give to me if I wanted to experience more freedom in my life, more joy in my life, or more peace in my life? He might say, based on Psalm, what he says in Psalm 32, that perhaps you need to uncover yourself. And that sounds a bit cryptic, doesn't it? But um, if you want more freedom, more joy, and more peace in your life, David might say to you, uncover yourself. We've been going through uh, the Psalms this summer, picking out some of our favorite Psalms, and this week um, I felt drawn to look at Psalm 32. So if you've got your Bible with you, please could you turn to that now, we're just going to read through it together. And it should be appearing behind me. Yep. Great. I'm reading from the ESV. Blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord counts no iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no deceit. For when I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was dried up as by the heat of summer. I acknowledged my sin to you and I did not cover my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. Therefore, let everyone who is godly offer prayer to you at a time when you may be found. Surely in the rush of great waters, they shall not reach him. You are a hiding place for me. You preserve me from trouble. You surround me with shouts of deliverance. I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will counsel you with, your, with my eye upon you. Be not like a horse or a mule without understanding, which must be curbed with bit and bridle, or it will not stay near you. Many are the sorrows of the wicked, but steadfast love surrounds the one who trusts in the Lord. Be glad in the Lord and rejoice, O righteous, and shout for joy, all you upright in heart. Psalm 32. Have you noticed that you can be a mature Christian, saved, committed to the church, faithful, exemplary in your behavior, but still lacking contentment and freedom? Why is it that we could spend years reading the Bible, studying the Bible, learning God's word, spending time with him in our devotions, listening to sermons, applying them? You could be the greatest prayer warrior, but still feel a nagging distance from God, filled with anxious thoughts, never really settled, full of tension. You can be doing the right things, but it just doesn't click with God. I feel this all the time. Perhaps you do too. But in Psalm 32, we see King David, who the Bible describes as a man after God's own heart. We'd all love to be described in that way, wouldn't we? Even King David is deeply unsettled, both mentally and physically, He says his bones are wasting away. He's been groaning all day. His strength is dried up. Now that doesn't sound like someone living in freedom and contentment, does it? It sounds like someone in torment. How could this happen to someone like David? How could this happen to mature believers? Now, you might see yourself in some of that. You might not use the same dramatic language that David uses, Um, It is a poem, of course, but maybe you feel something similar to that restlessness in your heart. Could you honestly say that you're living a peaceful and content life? 
perhaps if we did a survey, I wonder how many people would put their hands up and say they're living that today. It's an important question, isn't it? When we're witnessing to our friends and family, when we're inviting them to church or to consider Christianity, are we ourselves living and modeling an attractive way of life? Would those people look at us and say, I've got, I want what they've got, that peace and contentment? Or are our hearts full of restlessness? Do you get stressed out by everyday things, by seemingly, in the grand scheme of things, inconsequential things, and wish deep down that you wouldn't and that you didn't get stressed by those things? I know I do, all the time, every day. But Psalm 32 brings good news for us this morning. Um, you may have heard that Olivia Newton-John, famous actress known for probably for her role in the Grease movie, sadly passed away recently after her third battle with breast cancer. She, w- she went on to be one of the most successful musicians. Uh, sorry, it went on to be one of the most successful musicals ever filmed, but she went on to have a successful music career, selling over 100 million records with hits such as Xanadu, Hopelessly Devoted to You, But she was also a prominent activist for breast cancer research, the environment, and animal rights. She was universally loved. She was famous and successful, but she also suffered. When someone like that speaks about how they get through life, what the meaning of life is, or how to be happy, we tend to sit up and listen, don't we? They've had success and fame, but they've also struggled. I remember I was driving along, listening to my radio, hearing the news report about her passing away, and they focused on how she was notoriously upbeat and optimistic. When she was asked, and they said to her, how do you have such a sunny outlook on life? She said this, cancer doesn't define you. It's only a part of who you are, but my outlook on life has changed. Even more, especially this time with my third diagnosis. I do something I enjoy every day, and I don't sweat the small stuff. I try always to live in the moment. Every day is a gift. Don't sweat the small stuff. That was her mantra, if you like. We hear versions of that all the time, don't we? That life brings at you, and stuff comes at you in life, and they may be big things, and they may be small things. And... I think what she's saying is the secret to a happy life is a matter of categorization, right? We need to recognize which are those big things, put those in the bucket of concern, and which are the small things, we put those in the bucket of least or or no concern. When someone like Olivia Newton-John says this, well, maybe there's something in that. Don't sweat the small stuff is a mantra that was popularized by a psychotherapist and motivational speaker called Richard Carlson. And his book, Don't Sweat the Small Stuff, published in 1997, quickly hit all of the bestseller lists. In the blurb, it says this, so many of us would like to live our lives in a calmer and less stressful way and be able to let go of our problems. This is the book that can show you how to stop letting the little things in life drive you crazy. Who wouldn't want that? Letting the little things in life drive you crazy. Um, Could someone grab me a a glass of water? I'm getting really thirsty. Is that all right? Neil, do you mind? Thanks. Who wouldn't want that? And this book was so popular, it spawned a number of spin-off versions. Don't sweat the small stuff for fathers. Don't sweat the small stuff for mothers. Don't sweat the small stuff for newlyweds or for teachers, for new parents, in friendships, at work, with your family, and many, many more. There's even a workbook, including exercises, questions, and self-tests to help you keep the little things from taking over your life. It seems as though there's no area in life where we're not in danger of letting the small things take over. Actually sounds quite stressful, doesn't it? But it just shows, doesn't it? We are hungry. We are hungry for peace and contentment, perhaps even more so today in in the relentless pace, thank you, Neil, and changing nature 
of the world around us. Thank you. And I think when you become a Christian, you become religious, it doesn't really stop, does it? In fact, it could get worse. Now, we know the big things, they're sorted, aren't they? We're saved, our relationship with God has been restored, we have eternal life to look forward to. Those things are dealt with. But in the meantime, there's still an awful lot of things to navigate. I know I should read my Bible, but how much is enough? I know I should pray, pray for the church, pray for myself, but for how long? I know I should help the poor, but how much should I give? I know I should share the gospel, but how often and to whom? I know I should be excited about church, but sometimes I feel a bit flat. Not sweating the small things sounds good, doesn't it? But as Christians, we know that small things can be signs of much bigger issues. Just take the Sermon on the Mount, for instance. Far from trivializing the small things in our lives, a bit of anger here, a bit of lust there, Jesus ramps it up. Jesus says our inner thought life, even that, needs to be faultless. It's not just about our outward behavior. He says that you have heard that it was said to the people long ago, you shall not murder, and anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you that anyone who is angry with a brother or sister will be subject to judgment. You have heard that it was said, do not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman to lust for her has already committed adultery in his heart. He goes on to say that our righteousness, our purity, our holiness needs to exceed the scribes and the Pharisees. Those guys were the modern zealots. They dotted every I and crossed every T of the law. Jesus expects us to be better. How can we not sweat the small things when, according to Jesus, everything matters? I'm not sure Jesus would agree with that mantra. But as I keep saying, Psalm 32 is here to help. Psalm 32 tells us that your state of peace and happiness as a Christian is dependent on whether you truly believe that the God of the Bible is a merciful God. We all have two choices when it comes to our sin. This is what we see. We can cover it, or we can confess it. The Bible says that the human instinct is to cover up. We see this in the full narrative. In Genesis 3, Adam and Eve disobeyed. But when they realized what they'd done, their response was not to come to God and confess, but to cover it. It says the eyes of both of them were opened, and they realized they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. They hid from the, God, from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man, Where are you? And the man answered, I heard you in the garden. And I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. Rather than collapsing into the safety of their loving Heavenly Father, they were scared, they covered themselves, and they hid among the trees. Just goes to show the broken relationship that man has with their Creator. And isn't it strange that God would call them, where are you? Of course God knows where they are. He knows what they've done. He knows what they're doing. But he's drawing attention to the bigger picture. Adam felt his nakedness and he couldn't bear it. He didn't just feel guilt, he felt shame. Adam felt unclean, he felt exposed. Guilt is feeling bad about what you've done, But shame is feeling bad about who you are. So there arises the need to cover up. Don't, I just don't want to be seen by God. I don't want to be seen by anyone. I don't want to be seen, full stop. 
That pattern continues today. It's like a template handed down to us. We all have this impulse to hide or stuff it down or cover it like a beach ball. You try and submerge it under the water and it always pops up, doesn't it? It happens in King Saul in his life. He tried to cover up with a sacrifice. King Saul tried to cover up by doing something on appearances quite good. In 1 Samuel, we read that Israel, they demanded a king from God. That was not God's plan A. He wanted to be their leader. He wanted the people to look to him. But Israel wanted what everyone else had wanted. They wanted a king. And they chose Saul, who was not a man after God's own heart like David. And towards the end of his reign, God ordered Saul to do something. But Saul only did half of it. Like Adam and Eve, Saul could only partially obey. We read later that Saul let this happen because he was afraid of the people and gave in to them. It's not very king-like, is it? He tried to cover it up, almost like taking out insurance. He decides, he realizes what's happened and decides to make a sacrifice to God. It's like he's saying, okay, I didn't do exactly as God commanded, but I did do this other thing that he likes. It's like us saying, you know, I'll live my life for you, God, but I still like to keep this vice or that vice, or I'll go to church every Sunday, but the rest of the week, that's my, that's my time. So Samuel, a prophet, God's spokesperson, rebukes Saul. He says, to obey is better than sacrifice. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he has rejected you as king. God took away Saul's throne and cut his dynasty short. To obey is better than sacrifice. And what about us? When we feel guilty about something, does not an impulse arise within us to do something good, to cover over? Are you quite good at telling yourself, you know, it doesn't matter if I drink too much sometimes, I give to the poor. I'm always doing that. It doesn't matter if I live however I please, I tithe regularly. It doesn't matter if I always get into arguments online, because I'm right. It doesn't matter if I push myself on others, because I'm doing God's will. Ah, that bit of road rage, that's, you know, it's not a big deal, because in person I'm really nice. It doesn't much matter if I watch a bit of porn, because I'm a great dad, I'm a great husband, I'm a great mum, I'm a great wife. It doesn't matter if I gossip every now and then, because I know my Bible really well, and I can lead a good Bible study. It doesn't matter if I was unkind to that waitress the other day, because I've had a hard day serving God. We can dress our prayers up, sign up for every rota, take on leadership, put ourselves forward, but God knows our heart. As David says, my sacrifice, O God, is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart you, God, will not despise, in Psalm 51. Jesus condemned this attitude in the Pharisees, didn't he? Like Saul, their religious activities were only done to look good in front of others. And it's not that these various offerings or good things are bad by themselves, are they? That's the tricky thing. But when good works or spiritual disciplines are done while disobeying God's direct commands, or when we make a show of them to get other, other people's approval, our sacrifices and good works are a sham. Perhaps covering up isn't your issue. Perhaps you're more inclined, like David did, to keep silent or hide, as Adam did, just avoiding God. Perhaps escaping feels like the only option to you sometimes. Escaping into nice food, escaping into alcohol, escaping into shopping or televised sport, money or possessions and careers, status, importance, friendship. Perhaps you escape into ministry. The next holiday, security, entertainment, Clothing, that Friday feeling, comfort in general, social media. These are all good things, aren't they? 
nothing wrong with these things in and of them, in and of themselves, but when we use them to hide from our problems, we're turning to created things instead of the creator to find our peace. Only God will give us the rest that we crave. So what has all of this got to do with being content and at peace within yourself? David felt the urge to cover his sins, but for day and night, God's hand was heavy upon him. God would not let him rest. Neither would his own conscience. David tried ignoring it. He tried stuffing it down. He tried pretending it didn't exist. He tried distracting himself, but deep down, he knew there was a problem. And in his pride, he tried to cover that sin from the God who knows and sees what is done in darkness. In trying to deceive God, David just ended up deceiving himself. So what does he do? What is the answer? I will confess my transgressions to the Lord. In humility, eventually, and perhaps out of exhaustion, he knows that the only way to get peace is to confess, to be honest with himself and God, admit his weakness, and look to God. And friends, what does God do for David? He forgives his transgressions. He does not count his iniquity against him. He becomes a hiding place for him. He preserves him from trouble. He surrounds him with shouts of deliverance. He covers his sin for him with his righteousness. David burrows God's righteousness, just like we do. When in our humility we lay ourselves bare before God, he, in response, in his great mercy, covers our sin for us. And he restores us. This is our hope as a Christian. And what about for you? Will you freely come to him or will you continue to cover them up? And we have this instinct, don't we, especially in church settings, to hide our true selves. We put on our church clothes, don't we? We put on our best behavior when we're around other Christians. When we're all doing that, it creates a culture. But if the gospel is true, I'm free to be exactly who I am with whoever I'm with. God accepts me. He's seen everything in me. He knows the state of my heart, which is really good. I don't need to be, I, therefore, I don't need to pretend to be better than I am. Not before him, not before anyone. The author Tim Keller puts it succinctly in saying, the only one who knows you to the bottom loves you to the skies. Because God is merciful. The extent to which you're able to truly believe that God is merciful by nature determines the peace and contentment you live with. You're not expected to be sinless. God doesn't expect that from you. Rather, a Christian is someone who is honest with God and truly believes God's promises of forgiveness, and so freely confesses their sins. That's our, the invitation to us in Psalm 32. If we uncover ourselves, he will cover us. He will take our filthy rags and give us his robes of righteousness, but only when we're willing to reject any holiness of our own. This is the path to deep and lasting peace. This is how we obtain eternal life. If we continue to cover ourselves, we remain under God's judgment. This leads to death, pain, misery, no rest. But Jesus says this, take my yoke upon you. I am gentle and lowly. He says, give me your sins. Give me your selfish desires. Give me your resentful spirit. Give me your lustful eye. 
Give me your rage. Give me your impatience, and I will give you peace. Jesus says, you don't have to hide from me. That's the deal of a century, isn't it? I give him all my rubbish, and he gives me the one thing I need. Don't sweat the small things. Well, as a Christian, you are truly free to not sweat the small things or the big things, because it's all covered by the blood of Jesus. Psalm 32 says this is the blessed person. This is the happy person, the content person. The forgiven are truly happy, not because they believe it intellectually, which is important, but because they believe that God is a merciful God in their hearts. No one needs to compel God to show mercy, but the faithful choose to confess their sins because he is merciful. So that's our our invitation this morning, is to choose to believe that God really is merciful and that he wants to be merciful to you this morning. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Lamentations 3. The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in loving kindness. Psalm 103. I am not a patient person. I'm not a patient man naturally, but praise God, he's not like me and he is not like man. Because God just doesn't just put up with us. He doesn't just tolerate you. He doesn't roll his eyes. God doesn't grow irritable with you over time. Nothing you do takes him by surprise. God doesn't condemn you. It's like the old, what the old Puritan Richard Sibbs says, there is more mercy in Christ than sin in us. That is our hope, isn't it? Um, Nathan, I just saw you walk out of the room, but did you hear me? Perhaps we could have the band back up. Thanks, mate. There is more mercy in Christ than sin in us. That is our hope, isn't it? That is our lasting, that is what will give us lasting peace and contentment. That is what will give us rest. I'm just going to read a famous hymn by Horatius Bonar from 1864, just to finish, and then I'll pray. And I'll be here at the front. I'm sure the leaders will be here. We'd love to pray for you if you, if you are feeling that restlessness in your heart. Not what my hands have done can save my guilty soul. Not what my toiling flesh has borne can make my spirit whole. Not what I feel or do can give me peace with God. Not all my prayers and sighs and tears can bear my awful load. Thy work alone, O Christ, can ease this weight of sin. Thy blood alone, O Lamb of God, can give me peace within. Thy love to me, O God, not mine, O Lord, to thee, can rid me of this dark unrest and set my spirit free. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, when you created us, you created us to live in peace, to live a life of joy with you in constant good relationship with you in constant communion with you walking in the cool of day but Lord something broke that and now we all inherit what Adam did so that our relationship with you is broken so instead of wanting to run to you when things are a problem we cover up we hide we justify ourselves Lord that doesn't lead to rest that doesn't lead to peace it doesn't lead to contentment. It doesn't lead to a life, the abundant life that you call us to, Lord Jesus. And so uh, as we reflect on this, Lord, we just pr- I just pray right now that if there's anyone here who's really struggling with something that they just keep going back to over and over again, or they struggle with feelings of just constant 
disappointment, disappointing you, Lord, that you could never accept them. Lord, I pray that as we come to worship you in response to this psalm, we would find a God who is merciful, whose arm doesn't need to be twisted, but it's your nature, Lord Jesus, that you are merciful, you long for us to return to you. I pray, Lord, that you meet with us now and speak to us intimately. In Jesus' name, amen.